Okay, happy May Day, and and we've another year celebrating International Workers Day, and uh, we were just talking um, a little bit before we got started. Of course, May Day has its roots in uh, Chicago um, when yeah. the the, the uh, Haymarket riots and the struggles for the eight-hour day and for much more than that. Uh, we have the Lucy Parsons uh, Human Rights School, and she, of course, is part of that struggle. But uh, Chicago uh, is a city that's important to all three of us, if I'm not mistaken. I I uh, finished high school in the suburbs and college in the city, and I'm a diehard White Sox fan to this day. Y'all are <laughs> Chicagoans too, right? In some, you know, like part of somewhat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you grew up there, right, Camille? Both of us did. Um, yeah, but I mean, I'm I'm born and raised Chicago, Southside Chicago. Yeah, I immigrated to Chicago <laughs> from Jamaica. Yep. Well, um, yeah. the Haymarket. So um the the whole haymarket experience was something that i heard about all my life um i remember my grandfather my father's father telling me the story of that it happened before he was uh before he was an adult i think he was alive but he wasn't an adult um but it really influenced the labor movement in chicago and it really influenced his thinking and the thinking of an awful lot of people that did labor organizing I, I come from a family of labor organizers, and, and they talked about it not just as um, a massacre, not just as a, an incident of the empire attacking the workers of the city, but as a sea change, as an occasion that really changed the way not only the, the workers themselves, but everybody who was looking on um, thought about the relationship between workers and and management or workers and the larger economy so it was a really very fundamental thing it yeah for certainly and it, it's always been i think it's a pride a source of pride for any worker who's done a day's work in in chicago or in that area that that um that chicago and that event has meant so much for workers of the world yeah. and I, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit. I wanted to talk to you. Uh, I was talking yesterday to Bamboshi some about this. Um, you guys have another very uh, powerful uh, relation with a city that has a huge connection with the May Day, some of the largest and most vibrant May Day uh, celebrations in the world are he held year after year in Havana, and uh, you both have been to Havana for May Day. And um, also we have some kind of sad news about uh, May Day in Havana. I don't know if one of you'd like to share like what you heard about that. Well, we, we were in Havana for May Day last year, and two million people in the streets in Havana alone. And May Day was held not just in Havana, but throughout the country. So each city had a similar type of parade. So actually, of the population of Cuba, there were probably half of the population in the streets last year for May Day. Unfortunately, this year, May Day has been postponed for one week. And I have a note from the Federation of Cuban Workers that says that May Day will proceed next week. But this week, they have, they're having problems. One problem is they're expecting today a major storm system that, because of the weather, they didn't think that it would be good to have people out in the streets like that. But also, they have a problem of gasoline shortage. And that's a major problem uh, for a country who has to constantly move people around, move goods around. And really the basis 
of these problems stem from the United States imposing a blockade on Cuba over 60 years ago. And this blockade have not succeeded in doing what they expected it to do in 60 years. Every year, the masses of the world come together at the United Nations and vote that the U.S. should lift this unilateral blockade because it's the United States alone is imposing this blockade and not just impl imposing it on Cuba, but imposing it as a extraterritorial law, which mm -hmm. means that other countries are being forced by the United States to obey this law, which is a United States law. Mm -hmm. And that's really impeding the self-determination and the rights to independence of sovereign countries. And of course, there are many countries that are neo-colonies to the United States. And so they actually implement this law without fighting it, while there are many other countries who are fighting it. There are banks who are scared to do business with Cuba because the United States will impose fines on them that if they do not pay, they cannot do business inside the United States, which is one of the largest uh, business transaction nation in the world. So this blockade has to go. And the blockade now has added over 400 different laws thanks to uh, Trump that even tightens sanctions and that kind of stuff. So that is the basic problem. It's not a problem of just oil shortage. Cuba cannot get oil because ships from Venezuela bringing oil are blocked physically by United States warships and United States Marines. I don't think people, you know, sometimes when we think about sanctions and blockades, I don't think they just sound like these like words like a, like I don't think people up here get the devastating impact and the fact that these sanctions really are an act of war that are enforced with warships and uh, that are cause causing just outrageous suffering in mean, yeah. Cuba and other countries. How has Cuba survived all so long? I mean, uh, what, January 1st, 1959, the Cuban Revolution succeeded. But Cuba is not a country that has many, many resources. And I know, you know, it had um, the support of the Soviet Union until the Soviet Union fell. But uh, how have they kept going? And... Uh, I think people should understand that it's not like some magical thing that Cuba will last no matter what. It's a daily struggle, is it not, to survive these sanctions? It's a it's a daily struggle, but it's important to note that it's a daily struggle of everyday people. Um, the U.S. embargo on Cuba is the United States with its knee on the neck of the Cuban people. Um, it's ordinary everyday people who suffer when there aren't parts to fix machines um, and medical equipment uh, that are used. People are dying in surgery in Cuba because the machines that administer anesthesia cannot be repaired. They're old and obsolete and new ones can't be obtained. Women are dying from breast cancer in Cuba where Cuba once led the hemisphere in lowering the rate of, of deaths from breast cancer. Now Cuban women are dying from breast cancer because their mammogram machines don't work any longer. They are 40, 50 years old and they can't purchase new ones. Um, Cuban, uh, Cuban people do without foodstuffs that they need. So when you ask how the island has survived, how the nation has survived, the answer is solidarity. The uh, Cuban people have pulled together and determined that this is a shared struggle 
that's going to be born equally by all throughout the nation. And whatever they do have is going to be distributed in an equitable way. Now, you mentioned that Cuba doesn't have a lot of resources compared to a nation like the United States. But when you consider that of all the wealth that the U.S. has, the vast majority of our tax dollars go to um, the support of a bloated military, the largest military by a factor of more than 10 in the entire world, whereas Cuba is spending what little wealth it does have on feeding and housing and educating and providing health care and clean water for its people. So that's how Cuba survived. Cuba survived by, by prioritizing their people. But we can't forget that this embargo really is a knee on the neck of the Cuban people by a big bully, the biggest bully in the world. I think... Um... Uh, let me just add also to... Camille, that the other part of it is the actual creativity of the Cuban people. And they have found a way out of nowhere to do what they have to do to survive. I mean, when the blockade was imposed and the Soviet Union fell in 1990 and they had what they call a special period they had no gas, just like now. Almost everybody in Cuba rode bicycles. They are creative. Well, it, they, they certainly are. I mean, I, I was only in Cuba twice, two different times in 2015, and just to see uh, the way people just uh, keep things going without the cars. The classic cars is a perfect example to uh, Cuba being famous for the classic cars. And it's because the blockade has kept other parts coming in, new cars coming in. So people have gotten very creative at repairing things. I wonder one thing that um, Camille was talking about reminded the healthcare issue, which reminds mm -hmm. me of both just the creativity and the resiliency and the solidarity of the Cuban people versus the sanctions. And that is the whole uh, experience we've all had with with uh, COVID because Cuba was one of the first countries to develop a vaccine. However, the blockade kept it from getting enough syringes to uh, distribute mm -hmm. that to everybody as quickly as they would want, you know, and, and therefore, you know, Cuba, of course, had to deal with a lot of damage from COVID, but it's just that they were one of the first to get a vaccine started, but the U.S. blockade kept the syringes from getting there. I mean, that's not just an attack on Cuba. That's an attack on the world's public health. It's an attack on humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to say that May Day hasn't been canceled. May Day, first of all, today is May Day, and the Cuban people recognize that today is May Day, and the Cuban people are celebrating May Day even if they're not doing it by gathering in the plaza in the midst of a near hurricane type rainstorm, May Day is happening in Cuba. And the reason May Day is happening in Cuba is that the Cuban people and the Cuban government both recognize how central labor is to everything that happens in the nation and in the world. And so May Day ain't canceled. It's just <laughs> that the big celebration is being punted to another day when they won't have to deal with monsoon-like rains, and um, they can they can um, adjust for the absence of fuel, for the unavailability of fuel. Now, tell us, for those of us who have not been there, uh, what is May Day like in Havana? What was it like for y'all to be there, surrounded by so many people in that square with the, you know, with the I mean, that famous square with all the, just everybody there. What was it like? Oh, my God. Well, From like two o'clock in the morning or all night <laughs> long, you could hear people in the streets coming by any kind of means of conveyance, people in buses and charter buses, people on the backs of farm trucks, you know, whole villages of people piled into 
a parade of trucks coming. The trucks are usually the kind that, you know, bring goods to market, bring agricultural goods to market. Um, people marching down the street, the party started. <laughs> you know, um, it's one huge party. And then have you ever seen two million people in one place at one time? No. It'll blow I your mind. <laughs> and seen... un unlike in this great country in which we live, the people were orderly. There were no there were no arguments. There were no fights. People were lined up quietly and patiently waiting for their turn to march down the street with their banners. Last year when we were there, um, Health care workers were centered because they of, of the mighty job that they did in uh, combating COVID-19. And so they were at the front of the parade, but there were people there representing all different kinds of laborers, all different kinds of industries. And it was orderly Two two million people um, in, in, in joyful celebration. And then when it was over, an orderly uh, return to where they came from without, I didn't see any trash on the street, you know, without any kinds of problems or anything. Um, and that again is, is symbolic of the unity that the Cuban people have. And the level of organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of this uh, level of organization and the coming of this, these storms, I mean, again, Cuba is a country without a lot of resources like a country like the U.S. or, you know, some other countries that might be mineral or oil rich. It is hobbled by the sanctions uh, without doubt when hurricanes hit uh, Cuba, it must be devastating. I mean, how does uh, Cuba survive these hurricanes compared to, like, say, nearby Puerto Rico? We were in Cuba a week after Hurricane Maria hit hit Puerto Rico, and and also Cuba, by the way, they're pretty close to each other. Um, and unlike Puerto Rico, power had been restored to the vast majority of the nation. Um, there were people from you know young children picking up branches on the street to grandparents um, chopping up uh, uh, tree limbs that had been downed and carrying them off and people helping their neighbors put tarps on their roofs that had been blown away. Um, and so we saw people, we saw quite a bit of evidence of damage from the hurricanes that had hit the island but I believe there was only one death, and that was somebody who was um, drunk and walking along the seawall at the time the hurricane blew in. Yeah, not a good but idea. one of the reasons that there was so little, um, uh, I won't say so little damage, there's plenty enough damage, but there, there were fewer deaths and uh, so, so much less destruction is the preparation that the Cuban government and the Cuban people did prior to the storm. Um, unlike in the United States where everybody is on their own, if there's a hurricane, you better get yourself to high ground or inland or, or you know, uh, board up your house or do whatever you do, but it's on you. But Cuba has a plan for evacuation in a hurricane um, or other kinds of natural disaster where people have assigned places to go to and transportation to get them there. And they take and people bring, people are prepared and they bring food and water. Um, even domestic animals are transported to safety because if you're raising chickens for eggs and meat um, and that's the way that you, you know, help support your family, you, you can't let the chickens die, you know? And if the, if the dairy cows um, all perish in the hurricane then there's no milk. So all of this is moved. Um, the neighborhood medics, their clinics, every few blocks, the way we have 7-Elevens, Cuba has clinics, um, you know, here and there throughout the neighborhood. And the medics in the clinics uh, gather together the medicine that they know that the people that they serve need, and they take them with them to the place up in the highlands where um, either in, in a place like a school gym or an actual cave or something like that, people are sheltering from the hurricane. So grandma's not gonna miss her insulin and 
and and your your pregnant sister is not going to miss her prenatal vitamins and her prenatal care because all of this is being taken together and grandpa gets his heart medication and so forth and so on with very little in the way of disruption because once again cuba with what little wealth it has does have the power of the people coming together and does prioritize the needs of the people unlike in so many other countries, most notably this one. So Cuba fares very well in general. But once again, with the knee on the neck of the Cuban people that this embargo represents, uh, we I had somebody tell us that his roof is going to be was going to be off for a while. And I said, well, you know, can't you just do it yourself? He said a, a sheet of plywood costs like $150 US in Cuba. Um, and that's something that at the time you could buy, you know, in bulk for $25 a sheet here if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, and it's because of the embargo. Instead of being able to get plywood right across the straits um, in, in Florida, uh, they had, Cuba had to get um, plywood from China. So consider the cost of shipping plywood all the way from China to Cuba, and you understand why plywood costs $150. But the people who suffer, once again, are the ordinary people, um, you know, families who have to live with nothing more than a tarp for their roof until, you know, the nation can gather the supplies to take care of it, which, by the way, they have done. And Puerto Rico still hasn't been made right. Well, I mean, I, I one thing that amazes me about Cuba is, despite all that it's facing, its generosity and its internationalism on you know international solidarity on you know on the world's stage and i was in haiti you know uh, just a we left just a few days before the earthquake there in 2010 but in haiti there's so much poverty you know really really outrageous poverty levels of poverty but there's also so much charity and people don't understand like charity. What does that mean? What that means is like a country like this literally happened. Haiti was able to feed itself, uh, provide its the, all the rice it needed for its population. And then the U.S. under the Clinton administration comes in with this cheaper charity rice that, you know, that was bought from subsidized farms in the United States, so it could be cheaper, brought into Haiti as charity, and it devastated uh, Haitian farmers. So it created, it wasn't just food that they're bringing in, they were bringing in dependency. And the U.S. and the, there's a whole charity industry in Haiti that is more oriented towards creating a dependency than any kind of self-sufficiency. But I saw from Cuba and from Haiti, from Venezuela, I saw they were like an airport was being built. I saw an electrical station that was built as a gift to the Haitian people from Cuba and Venezuela. I saw a market that was built for Haitian people to come in and sell their wares that was built by Haiti and, and Venezuela. So the uh, model that we we're seeing from Haiti and Venezuela was not charity and creating uh, dependency. It was solidarity towards autonomy and self-sufficiency. And it's just a huge difference. But I wanted to ask, I just have a couple more questions. So there are talks, you know, possibly changes afoot in regards to Venezuela. We don't know for sure, but Venezuela has been the target of devastating sanctions as well that have caused much suffering. But there is uh, some push towards lifting sanctions in Cuba and in Venezuela too. And uh, are they related to each other? If, if sanctions are lifted on Venezuela, will this help Cuba? Definitely, definitely. But I think that uh, while there are talks about lifting sanctions, the people in the United States who has the power 
does not have the political will, does not have the backbone to do what they have to do. Uh, there was a lot that was expected from Biden. He hasn't done nothing. Uh, there is a lot that he can do. He can remove Cuba from the list of countries sponsoring terrorism because they know that was a lie. Trump knew it was a lie when he instituted that uh, law. But still, again, Biden has not done anything. So well, you've gotten, I, I, I'm sorry, that was uh, my next sex, uh, question. Basically, it's like you, you mentioned all these uh, policies that Trump in place or put in place. Of course, we had that brief period of things opening up under the Obama administration. And a lot of us thought if, you know, if Biden got elected, that at least he would go back to the policies of the Obama administration. But no, what's we that about? Too. Yeah, so my question is, you know, talk a little bit more about that and what can we do? What do we need to do? I, I think that there is a fear in the Democratic Party about the Cubans in Miami who don't vote Democrat anyway mm -hmm. and the Cubans in New Jersey. And it's a fear that I think, really legitimize what they actually want to do. And while I would hate to hope that it's true, I believe that Biden is really trump light, And he will not do anything until he's pushed by the people of the United States to do it. And so that's, that is the hope for the hemisphere that the people of the United States will gain enough political consciousness to see that it's in their best interest to help support the people in the rest of the world, especially in this hemisphere. I want to say something. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. One of Cuba's main exports, a lot of people, if you say, what does Cuba export? They'd say, well, don't they grow sugar? Cuba's main export is medical care. Cuba sends physicians and medics, nurses, medication, medical equipment and supplies where they are needed. When the earthquake devastated Haiti, Cuba was the first nation to send medics. When the hurricanes devastated the Gulf Coast of the United States, Cuba offered to send medical care here. In Venezuela, a significant percentage of the people providing health care are Cuban, and that is the case throughout much of Latin America. Um, Cuba's vaccine, Cuba's COVID vaccine, but also Cuba has uh, vaccines against breast cancer and lung cancer and other advances in medicine that the United States does not enjoy. So while Cuba is um, exporting life, in the form of medical care and medicine, the United States is exporting weapons. 742 billion US dollars in the year 2021, according to Google that I'm looking at right here, which is close to 4% of the, of the gross domestic product of this nation for that year. So the United States is exporting deaths um, and engaging in proxy wars and keeping its knee on the neck of the Cuban people and, and denying them the gasoline that they need to run their, their vehicles and the medical equipment that they need to save the lives of their people, whereas Cuba is exporting life. Well, let me ask a question. Um, of course, Camille, you're the director of our human rights school so um, at ASGJ, so maybe you have some special insight of, about this, but let me just ask uh, both of you, how about workers in the United States of America on this uh, fine International Workers' Day, this uh, May Day? Um, how does this affect us? How does the fact that for, you know we export weapons to the tune of 4% of the gross national product, the, the prioritization of military spending 
over human needs, but also the sanctions against Cuba and Venezuela. Does this hit workers here at home in the USA? Very directly, as well as all the indirect ways in which it does. First of all, I do not want the stain on my conscience that I'm killing people because of the political positions of the administration of the nation that I live in. And that is not an insignificant thing. But more importantly, right now, the United States cries to the heavens that universal health care is not something that we can afford. Forget the fact that every other developed nation in the world has figured that out. And many undeveloped nations like Cuba have figured that out. And for that matter, Venezuela, you know, and many other poor places on the planet. But the reason for that is that the money, first of all, all wealth comes from labor. So if you're working, all the wealth, not just the tax dollars that you're paying in, but the profit that you create through your labor is going into somebody's pocket. In the United States, it's not going into your pocket. And workers need to ask why. Why do we create everything but get the value from so little of it? And that's a very fundamental thing. The United States population needs to look at the rest of the world, which is something that we don't do. We take Tucker Carlson's word for the way the rest of the world works, and that's not a very good way to proceed. So workers in other parts of the world are able to enjoy at least some of the fruits of their labor, not only in terms of salary and income, but in terms of the benefits, the social safety net that keeps them from suffering when inevitable disasters occur in every, as, as both on an individual and as a national, um, on, on a national basis. This is something that workers have a real stake in. We need to look to the workers of the rest of the world and recognize that only through solidarity of the workers do we have any hope of being able to le live a decent and sustainable life. If you ask the workers whether or not it's okay to build factories that we know pollute and, and, and you know pollute our air, our water, our soil, and everything around us, the workers are gonna say, heck no, because it's the children of the workers that are carrying asthma inhalers uh, from inhaling you know, a disease they get from breathing bad air. Um, if you ask the managers, if you ask the capitalists of the country, what do you think about you know, a smokestack that pollutes, they say, oh, we'll, we'll get to it a few years down the line. You know, right now we can't afford to build a new one. Well, you can't afford to build it because you want to put profit in your pockets. But it's up to the workers, really, who are, first of all, the origins of, of the wealth. And second of all, the vast majority of people in the country are workers. Americans, people in America don't see themselves as, as workers. You ask them who, you know, what class they belong to and they'll say we're middle class. If you're working for a living, if, you're, if your income, if your survival depends upon a paycheck, you're a member of the working class. And that is a, a good and strong place to dwell. Kind of like the story of the three little pigs. If you're middle class working on being rich, you're living in the straw house because that's a lie. You need to live in the brick house that is formed by workers recognizing the value of their work and, and banding together in strength and solidarity um, to create a more decent and sustainable and just world that includes taking care of us in this country, taking care of ourselves, and removing the needs from the necks of people in the rest of the world because we don't agree with the way their governments um, want to proceed. Well, thank you both. Uh, this has been a very good conversation, a great way. Uh, Y'all are a little bit ahead of me on the time zones, but a great way for me to begin my International May Day. And we want to get this up and out there as quickly as we can for people, other people to enjoy today as they celebrate. So in closing, I just want to, first of all, say that if people like to learn more about how they can get involved, you can go to our website, Alliance for Global Justice at afgj.org, including learning about the Sanctions Kill Coalition and the work that's going on there. There are other organizations, for instance, the National Network 
on Cuba, and AFGJ is a member of that. Pastors for Peace uh, is a good organization. There's some several different solidarity organizations you can go to for more organization and to get involved. Of course, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, GC, uh, which uh, Bamboshi is active, is a very important source of information. So in closing, and before we wish everybody a uh, one more happy May Day. Any final words? Arise, ye workers from your slumbers. Arise, ye prisoners of want. For reason in revolt now thunders, and at last ends the age of Kant. Away with all your superstitions. Servile masses, arise, arise. We'll change henceforth the old tradition and spurn the dust to win the prize. Solidarity forever. My favorite song. Reading for my favorite song. <laughs> I expected you to break out in the song. <laughs> oh, I, I'll post. I will repost my hillbilly version of that song I sang last year, I believe it was. And last year, just to say, for we this, you know, we were for May Day, we had a picket outside the Amazon headquarters here in Tucson, <laughs> and we're doing it again this year. So uh, cool. I hope that people will turn out and support their. May Day events and rallies and pickets all across the country as we do, as we workers of the world rise. I, I yeah, think the young workers have shown us the way. The struggle continues. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, I had a lot of fun. So let's get this up and out. Happy May Day, everyone. Yeah.